Check, check, check. Check, check. Peace, peace, look in, peace. Check, 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 my check, my check. Check, check, check. Check, check. <clears throat> Give me a few minutes, y'all. I'm finna uh share in a few groups real quick. Hotel I will wear a don uh uh Donna. Y'all give me just a few minutes. Uh, give me about four, three minutes. Let me share it to a few groups, and then I'll get started with the presentation. I'll check out the music real quick. I'm going to start in about three minutes. California. Uh, peace, peace, yeah, yeah. Uh, Hotel Satep and Rob, you still watching? Well, I'm finna go ahead and jump into it, man, and get started. Those come in, come in a little later. Green, green, the king, the loop, now green, I see. Green, 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 green
All right, the thing, uh, today's presentation. Oh, first, uh, before I get started, man, is my uh, my mic good? I meant to ask that while ago. Is my microphone good? Somebody just let me know. Go thumbs up, uh, or yes in the chat. Either one. I'm, before I get started, I want to make sure I'm uh clear. Yes, no. All right, so let's get started. Uh, first, I want to say ETM Hotep, Do I Do I U, Hekanu N, Amin Ra, Kwa Isekum, Do I Do I U, Netcha, Fatmo Alafie, Fatmo Iwa Pele, Igun Majube Iba I, Igun Gun Kiki, Igun Gun Modupe. This uh, presentation is called Portuguese in the Congo Presentation. All right, before we get started, Sean uh, coined the phrase for us, and he coined the phrase and ain't even using the phrase uh, in the Master Warrior Clan. Uh, he coined the phrase every time we do a presentation. We're supposed to say, let's uh, go, to, uh, go to war. So. Let's play the battle song before we go to war real quick. Disclaimer. <laughs> this is by disclaimer. Uh, I am not. Uh, uh, peace, peace to you, uh, Jadar. Uh, I am not a teacher, but merely a student sharing information. And that in, and that information provided for educational purpose only. And the, and if you are in doubt, do the research or have it verified by someone qualified. I reserve the rights to change the focus of this presentation to shut down, sell, or exchange the terms or use at my own discretion. All trademark, design, design rights, copyrights, resident names, models, logos, avatars, the sigmas, and marks used or cited by this website or the property of their prospective owner. I reserve the right to add information as it comes available and or adapt changes, improve information as it comes available in the future. Inputs wanted, changes, addition, deletions, I encourage. I always have to put that disclaimer out there before I get started. Uh, Hotep, uh, send last. Peace, 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 Elena. All right. Everybody knows that been watching my presentations while I do it on Facebook or whether I do it on my YouTube channel, Kofi Pisa TV. This is my saying. As I learn, we all learn. Again, I believe in this saying. Um, as we learn things, we should share information and pass information on down. Uh, to the family um, and those are uh, surrounded in our communities and our society. I I've, I've, uh, feel like this is the only way that we'll be able to go. So as I learn, we all learn. All right. First, I'm going to kind of walk you through the, the, again, the presentation is called Portuguese uh, in the Congo. So I'm going to kind of try to tell a story or try to get y'all familiar with who the Portuguese are, and who are the people in the Congo, and where these people in the Congo come from, and how the Portuguese 
ended up in the Congo, how the Portuguese ended up in, 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 uh, in Africa all the way around. Uh, who is the Portuguese? The Portuguese people are an ethnic group indigenous to the Portugals that share a common Portuguese culture and speak Portuguese as a primary language. Their predominant religion is Christianity. Listen to this now. Their predominant religion is Christianity, mainly Roman Catholicism. So remember that the Portuguese are, are Christians. They, they practice Christianity, Roman Catholicism. Remember that. Historically, the Portuguese people heritage includes the pre-Celtic, Celtic, Celtiberian, uh, Lusitarian, uh, Glossolabian, I know I'm saying these wrong, I'm pronouncing them kind of wrong, and Celtics. The Romans, Greeks, Scandinavians, and the Magorita Germanic tribes like the Vandals, the Vistigoths, Western Goths, and the Zabu. So these are the particularly of who the Portuguese are, the Greeks, the Scandinavians, the Dramatic tribe, the Vandals, the Vistigoths, uh, and so forth. So just trying to give y'all a, a peace, peace, peace. Uh, 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 Sister Ebony, peace. Uh, Badena, peace. Uh, Miss Reba, peace, peace. Josh, I try to speak to everybody to come in the, track, in, in the uh, chat. All right, why the Portuguese came to Africa? So let's find out. We know who the Portuguese are now, so let's... Uh, See why the Portuguese come into Africa. Portuguese expansion into Africa begins with the desire of King John the First to gain access to the gold uh, uh, pro produced area of West Africa. The trans sahara trade route between Sanghe and North Africa traders provided European Europe with gold coins used to trade spices, silk, and other luxuries from India. At the time, there was a shortage of gold and rumors were spread that there was, were stated in the South Africa which had gold. This new encouraged King John's son, Prince Henry, to send out expeditions to explore these possibilities. So here we're establishing that the Portuguese came into West Africa for gold. A piece of uh, uh, Uli Moss, if I'm saying your name right. So, and we're going to find out uh, a little bit more about Prince Henry because he had a detrimental role in uh, uh, the Portuguese coming into uh, Africa to send out expedition to explore these possibilities. At first, the Portuguese established trading stations along the west coast of Africa rather than permit settlements. They built forts of Cape uh, uh, Blanca, Sierra Leone, Elima, to protect their trade stations from rival European traders, such as the Dutch, uh, uh, the Dutch and the French. In this way, the Portuguese diverted the trade in gold and slaves away from the Trans-Sahara route, causing their decline and increasing their own status as a powerful trading nation. Portuguese. So. Let's, so now we know that the Portuguese, peace, peace, uh, Alafie, Alafie, uh, Cuban crisis. So we know who the Portuguese are. We know that the Portuguese came into Africa specifically for gold and other things, but specifically for gold. All right. Portuguese. So let's learn about the Portuguese. And I'm trying to walk y'all through these things before we get into who the people of the Congo is and how the, uh, the Portuguese ended up in the Congo and infected the people uh, in the con in the Congo. All right, so we're going to talk about the Portuguese discovery, which eluded into uh, um, the other. Uh, I can't even think. Well, we'll be, uh, the uh, age of discovery. So the Portuguese discovery. Portuguese uh, are numerous territories on um, maritime routes discovered by the Portuguese as a result of their intensive maritime ex exploration during the 15th and 16th century. Portuguese sailors were at the van were at the vanguard of European overseas exploration, discoveries and mappings the coast of Africa, Canada, Asia, Brazil, and what became known as the Age of Discovery. And we're going to talk about the Age of Discovery. Met, uh, met, uh, medical expedition started in 1419 along West Africa coast under the sponsorship of Prince Henry. You're gonna keep hearing his brother, keep hearing this guy named Prince Henry. Uh, peace, peace, uh, Ben, uh, Ben Hawk. And uh, Prince Henry the Navigator 
with uh, Bonmissalist Dias, which we're going to talk about Dias too, reaching the Cape Cod Hope, uh, entering the Indian Ocean in 1488. Ten years later, in 1498, Vasco da Gama, we're going to talk about him too, led the first fleet around uh, Africa to India, arriving to the Calicas of the starting of maritime routes from Portugal to India. Portuguese uh, ex, uh, ex, explorations, then the proceedings of Southeast Asia, where they reached J Japan in, 1450, in 1442, 40 years after their first arrival in India. In 1500, the Portuguese noble uh, uh, Pedro Alvarez Cabral became the first European to discover Brazil. Peace, peace, uh, uh, Brother Nahesson. All right. I'm going to uh, show this real quick, uh, real quick, how Portuguese became the first global sea power uh, history. Then we'll get back into uh, the presentation. That's Portugal is a country where the sea is and always has been regarded as a living being to be stared down, confronted. The song laments the price paid, but Portugal's greatest heroes, Bosco da Gama among them, are its explorers and their patrons during the Age of Discovery. In Lisbon, Portugal's capital, there's a monument to them, da Gama, Diaz, Cabral, Magellan, Prince Henry the Navigator, all those names you memorized in grade school and immediately forgot. But think about this. In the 14 and 1500s, their daring and navigational skill made little Portugal, smaller than the state of Indiana, the first global sea power and very rich. How it happened is a story about innovation which will begin at Prince Henry the Navigator's outpost in Sagres, the craggy and windswept southwest corner of Europe. The classical people, uh, Romans, Greeks, and other civilizations, they believe this is the, the point where the, the world finish. This is the end of the world? Yes, the that, that's the idea. Historian Artur de Jesus. They give you a picture, uh, very interesting, how the sun sets here. They believe the sun dived inside the sea and made, made, uh, made boil the sea, as you... As you boil uh, the sea? Yes, yes. But the Portuguese thought otherwise. <laughs> here, close to where many explorers began their voyages, Prince Henry surrounded himself with scholars, map makers, astronomers, as well as navigators amassing knowledge and intelligence, the 15th century version of R&D. Like a venture capitalist, he financed expeditions intended to push the boundaries of the known world for profit and to spread Christianity. The idea was to uh, take to other cultures, to other people, uh, to other lands, the, the Christianity. So Christianity and exploration were always tied together. Always. Prince Henry died at Sagres in 1460, but by that time, Portuguese explorers had inched their way south along the coast of Africa as far as Sierra Leone. In 1488, Bartholomew Diaz made it around the Cape of Good Hope, Ten years later, Vasco da Gama reached India. Then, just two years after that, in 1500, Pedro Alvarez Cabral discovered Brazil, and on it went, each explorer armed with knowledge provided by the last. Those are the main voyages, those lines represent routes that Portuguese navigators undertook on their early voyages of exploration. Lieutenant Gonzalves Neves heads the research department at the Portuguese Maritime Museum in Lisbon. At its peak, when Portugal was at the height of its power, how broad was Portugal's reach? From Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, to Tanegashima in Japan. From Brazil to Japan, with everything in between. New technology was key, and this is what it looked like circa 1440. A ship 
with triangular sails. And what is this boat called? Caravel. An ocean-going version of smaller fishing boats. The Caravel revolutionized exploration. Now, what would be the advantage of having this type of rigging? All right, I'm not going to play the whole video, but I just want to kind of play the video to kind of bag up some of the things that I was talking about with some of the previous slide with the Portuguese and uh, uh, peace, peace, uh, uh, John. And yeah, uh, Brother Cuban Christ, I'm just trying to paint a picture of who the Portuguese is before I get further into the uh, presentation. Uh, age of discovery um, or the age of explorations. Uh, approximately from the beginning of the 15th century until the end of the 18th century, in the informal and loosely defined term for the period of European history in which extensive overseas exploration emerged as a powerful factor in Euro European culture and was beginning to global globalization. It also marked the rise of the period of widespread adoption in Europe, col colonialism and uh, mercenism, um, as a national policy, many lands previously unknown to Europeans were discovered by them during the period. Those must, were already inhabited. From the perspective of many non-Europeans, the age of discovery marked the arrival of invaders to previously unknown continent. So we know the Portuguese went into these different regions to spread Christianity, but not only to spread Christianity, but to explore other lands. Um, for gold and their natural resources. Global, a global, global exploration started with the Portuguese discoveries of the Atlantic uh, uh, archipelago of Medellines, and those archipelago are nothing but islands, of Medellin and the Azaros, the coast of Africa, and the discoveries of the sea routes in India in 1498. And on the behalf of the crown of Castile, Spain, the transatlantic voyage of Christopher Columbus between 1492 and 1502, and the first uh, circumnavigation of the globe in 1519 to 1522. These discoveries led to numerous naval, uh, naval expeditions across the Atlantic, India, and the Pacific Ocean, and land expeditions in the Americas, Asia, uh, Africa, and the Australias that continue into the late 19th centuries and to end with the explorations of the popular regions of the 20th century. So the Portuguese discovery uh, developed into the age of discovery. Prince Henry, y'all heard his name a few times already on the video and in uh, two of the slides I already uh, uh, presented. Prince Henry established a school for the study of you. This is what you're talking about in the chat right here, uh, seeing Sean. Prince Henry established a school for the study of navigation, map making, and shipbuilding in 1920. His goal was to find a route to the rich spices trades of the Indies and to explore the west coast of America. Yeah, Prince Henry started a school. He's I don't they they call him a navigator, but Prince Henry never set sail and navigated anyway, anywhere. But he set up uh uh, schools institution where they start to develop uh, different types of wasn't no Africa boat selling sail across the Atlantic before these people but go that's a fact that's a fact seeing uh, uh, since Sean said that there wasn't no African boat selling sail across the Atlantic before these people but going that's that's a fact they created this technology this technology in order for them to set sail and to explore other different uh, lands. So Prince Henry set up this institution. We started bringing in individuals into this institution and started training them, started training them on how to build uh, uh, ships, how to uh, make maps, you know, how to become uh, geographicals, uh, 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 navigators, uh, and so forth, uh, creating uh, tools uh, to help them navigate across the seas and so forth. Uh, in 1415, Henry, his father, and his oldest brother led an attack on the uh, Guta, uh, the town of Morocco, along the Straits of uh, Gibraltar. Uh, the attack succeeded, and the uh, uh, the Guta, if I'm saying the name right, fell under the Portuguese control. Henry became the finest 
uh, 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 fascinated with Africa and continue about which the Portuguese knew little. He developed in desire to learn about the Muslims who lived there primarily in hope of conquering them and spreading Christianity. And he became aware in Africa, men, uh, aware of African many resources which helped him exploit the Portuguese uh, gang. He was very, uh, Prince Henry was very interested in, uh, in the Africa and the uh, age of discovery and so forth, the European, the Portuguese actually exploring those different uh, places in Africa ended up in the India, Asia, Australia, China, and so forth. This was funded by uh, Prince Henry also with the funding of his institution of creating these different technologies, technologies in order for them to set sail and explore uh, everywhere. And again, maritime or the uh, uh, Portuguese ex uh, explore, ex ex exploring these countries it also was uh, for them exploring for gold was also to spread Christianity. So keep that in mind. Uh, Dago Gamma was a Portuguese explorer, one of the most notable navigators of the age of discovery. He made two voyages sailing along the west coast of Africa in 1480, exploring the Congo River and the coast of the present day Angola of Nambaya. So this is the individual here that ended up and set sail uh, in the late 1400s. And he ended up on the Congo, uh, at the head of the Congo uh, River, where the people in the Congo uh, encountered uh, this, this individual here. Dago Capo erected a monument. It is called the Pedro in Sharp Point Banana. So this uh, thing here you would see uh, the Portuguese would set these things up um, wherever they would set sail and wherever they would land it. The, uh, they erected these, these the padros, if I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, Diago uh, was one uh, that uh, did this. Bartholomew Dias was one. Vasco da Gamo was another one. And Jaro Avaros was another one. These were Portuguese uh, uh, navigators. Let me drop something for the people. Go in, Kofi. Peace, uh, Chris Cook. Peace, peace. All right. This is, uh, and I think I messed this slide up. He set sail around the southmost tip of Africa in 1488, reaching India Ocean uh, from the Atlantic Ocean, from the Euro uh, from European known to have done so. And Bartholomew Dias, we're going to learn more about Bartholomew Dias. We're going to learn about his grandson. When I do the presentation on um, um, Warrior King, I mean Warrior King of uh, Ndongo, uh, we're going to talk about his uh, his grandson, his grandson being a governor uh, 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 in the Congo. We'll talk about that uh, uh, on the on the next presentation because all this is going to connect with all three presentations that I'm going to do. The Igo era, I like him either. Uh, Portuguese, this is the uh, ship, uh, the caravan. This is one of the uh, technologies that they created for as forming a ship and other different things on a ship in order for them to set sail. This is one of the popular uh, ships that set sail um, across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, Portuguese uh, caravan, this was the standard model used by the Portuguese in their voyage of exploration. The Latin rig caravel was able to sail close to the wind, closer than squ uh, square rig vessels. It could accommodate about 20 sailors. No, Vasco de Gamo, Christopher Columbus, Bartholomew Dias all used uh, the caravan. So this was a popular vote uh, that set sail across the Atlantic Ocean. All right, who were the group of people who settled in Central Africa? Earlier, the earlier people uh, to live in Central Africa were the forest dwellers who lived off the fruits and nuts and the galleries of the animals they killed. Uh, anthropologists call these group collective hunter-gatherers. These specialized hunters were pygmies or babuta, uh, and they began living in the area in about uh, 45,000 BCE, their descendants still live in the forest today. Who were the group of people who settled in Central Africa? And I'm trying, so first here, 
hold on, let's go back. First here, um, the earlier people, we know that they uh, were the uh, the Bamuta, who the, who the archaeologists called the Pygmies, you know, the, uh, the Pygmies, the short, the short group of people. They resided in that, uh, resided in that area in the beginning. And then be, uh, the beginning of about the fi uh, 500 BCE, a small group of people who spoke uh, related languages moved from West Africa to Central and East, uh, moved from West Africa to Central Africa and East Africa, forcing some of the groups of the Pygmies to retreat further into the forest areas of the region and absorbing others as they moved through. The migration of this category of the people called Bantu uh, lasted about, or Nutu, which, is, which means person, lasted about 2,000 years. Unlikely the hunter gatherers who have lived in the Congo region before these Bantu groups knew uh, how to smelt iron and begin working in a sophisticated, sophisticated tool. Finally, the third category of people called the Nalitit, I mean, the Nalites Na, Na, uh, moved into Central Africa from what is known as the Sudan, or brought with them knowledge of farming, fishing, and herding. Over a period of several hundred years, the Bantu came into contact with the Nalites uh, from the Northeast. Villages or farmings who had access to iron tools spread it across the Central Africa region. Eventually, these groups developed into distinct, distinct tribes with different languages and social structures. By about 600 uh, CE, more than 200 different ethnic groups occupied Central Africa region, each within its own customs and languages. Peace, peace, Richard Bruce. So um, I'm trying to walk y'all uh, through it. So we, under, we understand who the Portuguese are, um, why the Portuguese came into Africa, uh, we uh, we know they came in for gold resources and also to spread Christianity. We know Prince Henry, who was the son of King John, uh, who also set up the explorations of the Portuguese set and sail everywhere. Prince Henry funded the uh, the Portuguese to navigate across into Africa and so forth. Now I'm trying to establish who are the people in the Congo area? We know that in, uh, uh, um, the Pygmies or the, the Bamutus were the first people that was in Central Africa. And then around 500 BCE, we had people from West Africa begin to migrate into, uh, migrate into West Africa. And then later on, you had people from East Africa begin to migrate. But those from West Africa that migrated into Central Africa, and uh, at that time, these guys was uh, 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 smelting iron, uh, uh, working with sophisticated tools. And then you had later on, you had people that came in from East Africa into Central Africa, where these people from West Africa uh, came into Central Africa, and these guys were uh, uh, were, were uh, farmers or master farmers and so forth, and they intertwine with uh, uh, those people from the West and created other different ethnic groups uh, within Central Central uh, Central Africa. Uh, the Nihilistic people. The Nihilistic people are people indigenous to the Nile Valley who speak Nihilistic languages, which con constitute a large subgroup of Nilo-Sahara languages spoken in South Sudan, Uganda, Kenya, and Northern Tanzania. Uh, hotel, hotel, Artie. Teach Kofi. Maybe one day we need to go in order, in uh, uh, on the order of Christ for uh for sure, for sure, because I'm gonna talk about that a little bit in the next presentation. Um, I can't think of the individual name that um that deal with the order of Christ that also that was in the Congo. With the next presentation, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit, but yeah, we, we we can go in on that. Okay, so we know that the Portuguese they practice Christianity, right? And we know that the Portuguese came into West Africa trying to find uh uh develop natural resources. Uh, uh, I mean to uh, obtain the natural resources from Africa, specifically gold, silver, uh, copper, uh, and so forth. And we know that 
they also was coming to sp to spread Christianity. So did the people in the Congo, because a lot of people think that, uh, you know, uh, you know, a lot of our family that practice Christianity think that that's what our people was actually practicing was Christianity, which is inaccurate. And the Portuguese, so let's see that the people in the Congo, let's see that these people from the, uh, the Pygmies that were there, the Mobutu that were there, uh, the, the, uh, the people from West Africa that migrated there, the people that uh, from East Africa that migrated into Central Africa and created these different ethnic groups and so forth, did they practice Christianity pre uh, the Portuguese invasion? Okay, before the Portuguese arrived and began to convert inhabitants of the Congo to, the Christ to Christianity, the people in the Congo prayed to different gods and a shrine guardian called the Mata Mana Kabonga. The king religious title was Nazambia Mupungu, which means superior spirit. Tax collections was believed to help protect against disasters created by angry gods. Although the people in the Congo believed that the king was a religious leader, they believed that he could not deal with a great problem of diseases, death, and famine without the help from the gods. For this reason, kings tried to increase their religion power by symbolically marrying a spirit descended of Mana Kabunga. This tradition continued until the Portuguese Christian, Christian missionaries arrived in the late 15th century. At that time, they succeeded in converting the Mana Congo and his son to Christianity. The king's son was baptized, sent to Christianity Missionary School, and given Christianity name as Alfonso I. So you can see, go in on them, that goddamn thing. He, <laughs> so you can see that the people in the Congo, and the people in the Congo consist of the people that resided there with the Mabuntus, which they call the Pygmies, and the people that migrated in 500 BCE, the people from West Africa, the people that later came in uh, from East Africa and created these other ethnic groups in the Congo and other languages and so forth, they did not practice Christianity. They did know, didn't know anything about Christianity until the Portuguese came in with their missionaries. And you can see when they come in, once the king will convert, then everybody else in that region will convert. He will convert everybody else. So this is how the people in the Congo uh, at a particular time started to practice Christianity. But this, when they came in, uh, the Gago came in first, which we're going to get into. Uh, Alfonso, we're going to talk about uh, Alfonso. Hold on one second, y'all. All right, so we're going to talk about Alfonso. We're going to talk briefly about his father. So I wanted to establish that to make sure and to show you that those people in the Congo were not Christians until Portuguese came into uh, the Congo in 1481 when they came into the Congo and the missionaries came in and well, we're going to get into how they ended up becoming how uh, King Alfonso father uh, became a Christian and converted his son. I mean, uh, a son to Christianity, got baptized and then converted the whole uh, whole Congo area, the whole Congo empire into Christianity, which they didn't convert the whole empire into Christianity until his son took uh, took the throne. But in 1480, Portuguese ships arrived in Central Africa at the mouth of the Congo River, the center of the Congo Kingdom. It was from the Congo that the Europeans got the name for the entire region. Initially, the Congo were glad to trade with the Portuguese because the relationship provided a new market for the goods and they received goods from the Portuguese. The Congo also hoped that the Hope that the Portuguese would share new technolo te te uh, technolo uh, 
technical uh, knowledge. Tech, tech, hold on, how technology. I don't know what I was trying to say here, uh, but share the technology. In a few years, however, the Portuguese trader found that the Congo could not supply the volume of gold, copper, and other viable resources that they wanted. After the Portuguese established sugarcane plantations on the nearby islands off the coast of Central Africa, they found that African labor slaves to be a much more valuable commodity. So when the, uh, the Portuguese first came and reached the Congo River and the, and, and the people of the Congo encountered, encountered them, at first their relationship was just a trade back and forth. The Portuguese will get certain things, and we're gonna. I'm gonna talk about later on what the Portuguese gave um, uh, the people in the Congo, and what the Portuguese. I mean, what the Congo people, which we already know, was gold, copper, and it was some other resources that they gave the Portuguese. But the Portuguese, um, they wanted more. You know what I'm saying? They wanted more, and they couldn't get more. You know, at a specific time, and then when they set up these sugarcane plantations. Now they needed people to work those plantations, those islands that they had, so they wanted African labor. Slavery existed throughout the continent of Africa before Europeans began to travel there. In Africa, slaves were often prisoners of war. So I know there's some things that's going on right now uh, dealing with uh, Kemet, uh, Peace, Peace, James Miller, Hotep Senate Monica, Hotep uh, Jehudi. Um, um, carry the four Bantu ambassador Dago turned south to continue exploring new, right? He did, uh, turn boy, you you throwing them in there, yeah. Uh, educate them while I'm, I'm educating them too. Uh, sin, um, but uh, I noticed a, a thing going on. Uh, Kimmett had uh, slaves and uh, slaves, uh, was uh, we did the same thing as uh. What happened to us, and you know that's up for you know that's 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 up for debate. So slavery, I mean, uh, uh, slavery always taken form, but not in the perspective of what people are superimposing of what happened during the Atlantic slave trade. The Atlantic slave trade, what we called in slaves, were prisoners of war. I'm not gonna sit here and say that uh, it was all kumbaya on the motherland. We fought with our brethren. We fought with our kindred. We do that today. We fight with our mother sometimes. We fight with our father sometimes. We fight with our brother. We fight with our sister. We fight with our cousin. We have disagreements sometimes. So I'm not the person that's going to sit here and superimpose on you that the motherland was all kumbaya and everybody got along with everybody. I will be telling you a lot. But um, we warred with our, our other groups. We warred with other groups of people. And what we call what people were trying to super, what they're trying to do now is superimpose what happened via the Atlantic slave trade or what's going on with the conversation now. We have prisons of war. So let's see what the prisons of war was. When the people in the Congo, the people in the Congo war with, 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 with their brothers and kindreds, what, what happened? What was the, was these people so, were these, were these people uh, uh, um, um, treated the same way as what, our ancestors were treated via the uh, Atlantic slave trade. In Africa, slaves were often prisoners of war, captured from enemies whom were either eventually ransomed back to their families or sold to others. Frequently, enslaved people were allowed to earn money. Enslaved people was allowed to earn money or own land or own land or even marry locals. Over the course of generations, enslaved Africans and their Descendants were often able to assimilate into the new society. Peace, peace, uh, uh, Julia Jackson. So the prisoners of war, when we warred against our kindred, our families in other areas, they wasn't in plant, they weren't on a plantation. They wasn't being worked to death. They wasn't being double castrated. Their women wasn't being raped. These people were, once we went to war and they was captive, they was allowed to earn money. They was allowed to own land. 
And they was also allowed to marry locals. And after they worked out their debt and was able to be free, they was able to either assimilate in the society or go back to where they came from. This is Dago uh, here. This is just a, a little picture of him coming into uh, the Congo area in 1481. Uh, All right, this is uh, King Alfonso uh, father here. This is the guy that actually, when Diago came in, that he was actually the king at this time in the Congo. The Portuguese first arrived in the Congo in 1485 and were regarded as visitors from the land of the dead. <laughs> they call the Portuguese called the people, they was coming from the land of the dead. Nzinga Nikumu, Nzinga Nikumu, king of the Bakongo, was baptized in 1941. Nzinga uh, Nikumu took the name uh, Juan the First, and you we see this all through the kidnapping trade. We see that once our ancestor was kidnapped, they was stripped of, stripped of their name, their culture their language, and their spiritual systems, their ethics, their ethics, their morals, and so forth. So you can see his name is Nzinga Nakuwu. But once he established a uh, relationship with the Portuguese because he wanted to trade with the Portuguese, he was going to get the Portuguese copper, gold, and et cetera for them ex exchanging other goods, uh, um, and exposing uh, technology uh, to uh, to the people in the Congo to use. So this is the reason why he uh, uh, took on the uh, took on and converted to Christian Christianity. And once he was baptized in 1491, they changed his name to Juan the First, which his name is as uh, his name is Naku. And while he gave up Christy and listen. Even though he gave, even though he became a Christian, two or three years later, uh, hold on, he, uh, 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 the name Juan the first in honor of a Portuguese king at the time, Juan the second, and while gay, gay, while he gave up Christianity two or three years later, he said, "Oh, I'm gonna get rid of this. Let me throw this in the trash can." And and, it's, and I'm not trying to disrespect those that may be looking or may be watching that still following Christianity, but. The, the thing is, this was a foreign religion that came upon us. Our, we did not practice this, 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 this so-called uh, Christianity. But two years, three years later, Nukuwu, he, he said, let me get rid of this. So he went back to his indigenous faith. So two or three slides earlier, I showed you exactly what these people in the Congo was practicing, and it was not called Christianity. But Two or three years later, he gave up Christianity, and his son Alfonso persisted in the faith. Doing and his son Alfonso persisted in the faith during the 16th century effort to convert all of the Bakongo uh, continued through the works of the Jew sites. When the Portuguese suggested trading merchandise for slaves, the concept among the Congo and other people of the region was not new. However, the influence of the Portuguese and their high demand for slaves changed the local African society. Conflict between different groups intensified as they searched for new captives who could be traded for European manufactory goods, including weapons. The introduction of the gun disrupted society and changed the nature of the relationship with one another. Those with direct contact with the Portuguese could trade humans for weapons, which could then be used to capture still more slaves. So you can see in one of the slides I told you that they was trading different things back. And once the Portuguese began to set up these uh, 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 plantations on the islands for the sugarcane, they, they wanted slaves. They wanted bodies to work on the plantation. So they told the people in the Congo, 
they told them in order for them to continue to trade with them and give them goods and to give them technology or knowledge on technology, they will have to give them slaves. So the king agreed to do that with the enemies, the prisoners of war. So they began to give the prisoners of wars uh, to the Portuguese people. But something happened after he did that. He made a mistake. He did not want to do this. He was against doing that in the beginning. He was against this in the beginning. But he did it to try to embed uh, the Congo Empire, even though the Congo Empire, which we'll talk about in my third presentation that I'll do this week. I got a presentation that follow after this, and then the Congo presents. We're going to go into the empires. But and because we don't talk about the empires. But anyway, once they started, got exposed to these to these guns, the whole dynamic of the uh, of the Congo and the Kendras and certain things, it started to change and shift. Although Alfonso was outspoken, opposed to slavery and initially fought the Portuguese demands for human beings, he eventually relentlessly in order to sustain the economics of the Congo. Initially, Alfonso sent war, uh, war captives and criminals to be sold as slaves to the Portuguese. Eventually, the Portuguese demand for slaves exceeding the country potential supplies prompt their search for slaves from the neighboring region. Alternately, the demands for slaves uh, destabilized the Congo and its neighbors, all, as all stated in regions, initial wars to gain captives for slaves to the Portuguese. Alfonso, uh, I shouldn't even put that in, but Alfonso died in 1498. So once they began to get this new technology called the gun, he took on Christianity for the benefit of trading, but still practiced their local religion. They never gave up on their own. They, that's a fact. That's a fact. He took on the name of the Portuguese king. Y'all saw me put them one name in the comment. All right. This is Al King Alfonso. This is not his real name. This is uh, Nakuwu's son. We know Nakuwu took on the name Juan the first. If I'm pronouncing the name right, it was named after the Portuguese king once he was baptized in 1941. And he took on Christ, converted into Christianity, and then converted his son into Christianity. And then later on, his son King Alfonso took the throne in the Congo, took over the Congo Empire. And once he took over the Congo Empire, he started to uh, trade enemies or prisoners of wars to continue to cre uh, create a better economics economics for the Con for the Congo region. Born Nazinga Mibamba, King Alfonso I, King Alfonso the first was a leader of the Congolese people in the earlier parts of the 16th century. M. Bimba developed a strong trading relationship with the Portuguese and adopted capitalism as a result of this relationship. The influence of the Catholic faith reached every aspect of the king's life, from his name, which was changed to Alfonso. Like I said, once they was converted, which we see this all through the kidnapping. Once they kidnapped our ancestors, they took your name. They took your they took your name, gave you one of their names, Sally, John, Billy, Bob, all they gave they took away your native tongue and gave you their language. They took away your spiritual systems, your moral, your edict, your ethics, and so forth. Alfonso, upon his acceptance of capitalism to his understanding of government organization demonstrating his de dedication to his religion alfonso named capitalism the state religion and built many catholic churches throughout his kingdom in his establishing establishing the state religion alfonso called for the burning of any non-christian idols or objects related to magic or sorcery erasing significant aspects of the congolese culture and heritage and we see that all throughout africa these Christian missionaries coming into Africa and converting the kings and then first and then the king the uh, kings converting their whole uh, uh, kingdoms into Christianity and eradicating or trying to eradicate and again I'm saying trying to eradicate uh, their indigenous systems. In 1506 King Alfonso took the throne of the Congo. 
Alfonso converted Christianity and even communicated with the Pope in Rome. He sent his son to study uh, in Portugal, who returned to become the first black Catholic bishop. He also increased his power and size and his kingdom by using guns he purchased from the Portuguese. Beginning in the 1514, the slave trade became the intricate part of the economic of the area. Like all Congo monarchs, Alfonso owned slaves, but he was troubled by the nature of his new slave trade. In 1526, and again, when we warred against our brethren and we warred against our kindred. On a previous slide, I showed you that the prisoners of war that we took, that we warred in, they worked for money. They, they could own land. They could marry locals in the society. And even after they worked out their debt, they could uh, stay, in, in, uh, um, stay in the society or they could go back to where they came from. So he did not know that what exactly what the Portuguese were going to be doing with, the, the, uh, with these prisoners of, prisoners of war that he was giving or these criminals in the Congolese area he was giving to the Portuguese until later on he found out about what was going on. He didn't want to do it in the beginning, but he did it for the betterment of the Congo region. But then he found out later on what exactly what was rocking, what was going on with what the Portuguese was doing. Uh, in 1526, he wrote to the Portuguese kings about the, dis uh, the disruptive uh, effects on the kingdom. Hold on one second, y'all. All right. So once he realized what was going on and so forth, he started writing letters and communicating uh, in 1526 and so forth. There was many letters that was written to uh, the Portuguese kings of his concerns of what was going on and so forth. Um, uh, here is one of the letters, which I'm not I didn't put the whole letter up there and so forth, but I share it. Uh, in one of my sources, and you can go to the source and you can look at the letter in, uh, letter in its entirety, and you can look at some of the other letters that he sent back and forth from the Congo to uh, to, Port to Portuguese. Uh, here's a letter, Sir Young, and here's his, his, his letter. Uh, Your Highness should know uh, how our kingdoms is being lost in so many ways that it is convenient to provide for the necessary remedies. Since this causes the excess, excessive freedom given by the agents of the officials to, to the men and the merchants who were allowed to come to this kingdom and set up shops with goods and many things which have been prohibited by us. And this was a mistake that he made also. Uh, Hotel uh, Antoine, uh, Saint Antoine, he's writing a letter to the Portuguese and he's stating what's going on. We know on a previous side that he, he started exchanging goods they started exchanging goods but the portuguese were getting greedy and they wanted more when they wanted more with the gold the copper and etc etc when they set up the sugar plane the sugar cane uh plantations on those islands they needed bodies so they told the portuguese you basically they renegotiated okay we're not we're going to stop giving y'all goods or exchanging our goods which y'all we no longer want that we want bodies we want bodies so Alfonso, or his original name, M. Bimba, he did it for the betterment of the economics, so he started giving the prisoners of wars and the criminals to the Portuguese. And then he found out exactly what the Portuguese was actually doing because what they called slavery or the prisoners of war was not what the people in the Congo were doing when they were warring against their brother and their kindred um, and so forth. So, and then they begin, they, the Portuguese gave them uh, these guns or these muskets and so forth. And that was a big mistake when they gave them them guns. And then another big mistake was when they gave them the guns, uh, he, uh, Mabamba, uh, Alfonso I, he started letting the Portuguese merchants and so forth come into the kingdom. But with this uh, st stipulation of agreement that he had with the Portuguese, that the people that came in, they would not take anybody and and uh, 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 and, uh, and capture uh, uh, them, and then send them back out uh, to these 
uh, plantation, which we know a lot of the people from the Congo ended up in the uh, Brazil area, ended up uh, uh, in Brazil. But um, he, uh, but he, he allowed these guys to come in, and these guys came in with these goods and so forth. And this was a big mistake that he also made. Then he made there. Peace, uh, Elmas Burks. Peace, uh, Tabitha. I'll uh, try to speak to everybody in here. Who are allowed to come to the kingdom to set up shops with goods and many things which have been prohibited by us and which they spread it throughout our kingdom and domain in such abundance that many of our vassals whom we had uh, in obedience do not comply because they have the things in greater abundance than we ourselves. And it was with these things that we had them content and subject under our vassalage and jurisdiction. So it is doing a great harm, not only to service of God, but to security of the peace of our kingdom of the state as well, because of the thieves. And that's, that's, you know, these people, and, and you, you see how, uh, we are still in this, 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 this indoctrinated mind state. We know that the people in the Congo was converted to Christianity. We know that they did not uh, have Christianity until the Portuguese came in. And these, and you see how his father was converted and baptized, and then he he gave it away. Didn't know what to do. And his son picked it up, and then he converted everybody in the Congo. And you see, he's using the service of God, and he's talking about God. And he sets up these uh, 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 churches. Uh, in the Congo area, but these same people that's, that gave us Christianity, that came in and given us Christianity, you know what I'm saying? You see how he, he, he's talking, and these people that's given us Christianity, they don't even go by uh, uh, um, what you know what the the uh, religion uh, uh, entangled to be. So, and I, I, and I I'm, I'm I'm saying that you know because I, I see a lot of that that's going on um, going on now because of the thieves and the men of bad conscience grabbed them wishing to have the things and words of this kingdom which they are abolished uh, uh, of they grab them and get them to be sold and so great sir it is corruption and lineage see what's happening here is the letters that he's writing that he's writing to the portuguese he's explaining that once he got those guns once he let those portuguese merchants come in to the territory now you're starting to see criminal behavior, more criminal behavior starting to take place in the Congo. These people, these merchants are actually giving away their goods and giving technology to anybody in the society to help them to illegally capture slaves or illegally capture the people in the Congo, in the Congo area to send them out to Brazil, to Brazil and these islands to work on the sugarcane plantations. So, um, so a lot of ruckus started to take place, and they no longer started to see the the jurisdiction or the uh, uh, the uh, the um, uh, kingdom of uh, 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 the uh, the majestic society was over uh, the uh, the prisoners of wars and the criminals who were go who they was going they was in the control of who they was going to give to the Portuguese, but now. Once they got the guns into uh, Central Africa and they got the Portuguese uh, mer uh, uh, merchants to come in with their goods. So these merchants started to entice the people in a society. I will give you these goods. I will give you these guns and so forth if you help me kidnap some people. So they started taking people out of the Cong out of the Congo area. So the, the pop, the, the, the area started to become depopulated because the people, uh, the local people in the society wanted these things that the Portuguese had. So the Portuguese bribed them with these certain things. And then once they got these guns, it was easier for them to go into the area and take the people out of their own area and give them to the uh, give them to these Portuguese merchants. And these Portuguese merchants would stamp them and seal them. And later on through the letters, because I'm not going to finish reading this, but I'm going to give you the source. So you can go and you can read the letters and see some of the other letters that he was writing back and forth, talking about how uh, he made a mistake and he didn't know what was actually happening with the people that he was giving to the Portuguese 
and how these people was being treated and then how he obtained these guns from the Portuguese and how he let these merchants, the Portuguese merchants in with their goods in the society and how they ended up bribing their people and causing a lot of criminal activity and conflict amongst his own people. And they started kidnapping their own people for the Portuguese in order to have these good things. So he was figuring out, he was, he was made a mistake. So he was trying to get uh, the Portuguese king to stop, to stop, uh, he no longer wanted to contribute to this Congo slave trade. He no longer wanted to give the prisoners of war or criminals up to the Portuguese. He wanted to renegotiate uh, 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 exchanging goods and so forth with the Portuguese once he realized exactly what was going on. So a lot of this is exchanged throughout the letters with uh, Mubamba, uh, uh, the uh, king of, of, of the Congo Empire, uh, with the king and the Portuguese during the 15th, uh, 16th century. And here, this is just another, uh, this here is a picture. You can see the missionaries, you know what I'm saying? Like I said, you see this all throughout. throughout. You have the European missionaries, the Christian missionary come in. Uh, and, you know, the first thing, you know, they try to do is convert the king and so forth. And then the king convert uh, the uh, his uh, kingdom over and to uh, the foreigners' uh, religion and try to eradicate, uh, um, try to re eradicate their digital system. That's why we fail to know what our traditions and our traditions are, and we continue to gravitate toward the invaders, the colonizer, the uh, the oppressor, the slave master of uh, religion. Alfonso, please, no effects. Alfonso please no effects. And again, that letter was his please, those back and forth letter from 1526 and so forth to the Portuguese king. It had no effect. Instead, increasing numbers of European notables, the French, the British, and the Dutch came into the region to purchase more slaves for their plantations in the New World. By the late 18th century, Europeans were exported about 15,000 slaves uh, per year from the Congo. M. Banzansa, the capital city of the Congo Empire. And you here is the Congo Empire. And on the first uh thing, on the first slide, my first slide, um uh I had the Congo Empire. The Congo consisted of a bunch of different provinces uh, uh on the Congo Empire. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more on the part three, and I'm gonna talk about it on part two uh with the uh Queen Warrior of Nigan uh Nidongo, which is also a uh, kingdom uh, uh, in the Congo, the Congo, uh, uh, a part of the Congo Empire, but Mbansa, the capital city of the Congo Kingdom, was a popular place for trading among Africa. Africans. The people of the Congo paid for goods from other parts of Africa with local product products such as raffia. I talked about this, which is a, a palm tree, uh, which they uh, uh, they made material, they made fiber, they made clothes from this palm tree. A scrap, a, 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 uh, uh, making fiber for the clothes. I talked about this in one of my presentations uh, dealing with the African clothes. I don't know what the name of it is, but you can check that out on Kofi Pisa TV. I got a part one and part two. Uh, so just scroll down uh, the content that you come to something with African clothes. I don't know what the name of it is, but I talk about the plant, the clothing, how they extract the plant to make uh, from the fiber to make the uh, clothing and whatever, such as wrapping clothing, woven from the fibers from the palm, pottery, salt, copper, iron, and ivory. So these are things that we traded amongst each other. So uh, Mbaza was, which was the capital of the uh, Congo uh, Empire, this was a trading place for all Africans to come and trade their goods and swap their goods out. I may not have, I may not have silver, so I may swap silver out over here with you. I may ex exchange silver, and you may give me copper. You see, I, you know, so and back and forth, I may have. Uh, salt, you might, I might be exchanging salt. You may be giving me the raffiar plant, uh, raffiar plant. When you, I may be over here, you may be have ivory. I may not have ivory, so I may be exchanging ivory for quarry shells. It just was an exchange. And by, uh, the people of the Congo paid for goods for other parts of Africa with local local products such as raffia clothing, wooden fiber, palms, pottery, salt, copper, iron. And ivory. They also paid for goods with small spiral seashells. 
and uh, called Nizimbu shells. So you can see um, that we use uh, seashells and coral shells as an exchange of money. You know what I'm saying? Uh, this was our money. And you can see these quarry sales and shells throughout our uh, um, our traditions. And again, we didn't use uh, stones and uh, these other different things that we started to intertwine into African culture. You know, uh, we use shells. We use quarry shells. We didn't use them, them stones and all those other different things that are uh, and nothing wrong with that if you're using it. But just again, just try not to mix and match things in somewhere that it don't belong in. The Portuguese first arrived in the Congo to trade and spread Christianity in the late 1400s. Friendly relationship developed between the two empires. The Portuguese converted the majority of the Congo people to Christianity. Traded between the groups of pros uh, 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 were prosperous. Portuguese traders exchanged Europeans and Asian goods like silk. These are some of the things that they traded uh, 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 um, with the people in the Congo and so forth, uh, like silk, linen, velvet, glass, mirrors for items such as sugar, co uh, copper, and ex uh, skins. So they, ex uh, and I'm going to show some more things, they, linen, velvet, glass, and mirrors. And uh, eventually, however, the Portuguese begin, began demanding that their goods be paid for within human slaves. As the Portuguese pressured uh, the many Congo to send more and more slaves, the Congo kingdom began to weaken. It also estimated uh, that by 1680, almost one million Africans had, take, had been taken as slaves from the Congo region. These are some of the other things, clothes, satin, scripts, kettles, umbrellas, brass rods, iron, cooking pots, pipes, mirrors, knives, beads, muskets, gunpowder, and trade of all local products. These were some of the things that the uh, Portuguese traded with the people uh, in the Congo area. And again, this was what, was what they was exchanging the gold, they was exchanging copper and so forth from the Congolese area, and the uh, Portuguese were giving them satin scripts, kettles, umbrellas, brass rods, iron crock pots, uh, pipes, and mirrors, knives, and soap, and the muskets. And again, this was the gun, the gun, muskets, and gunpowder. And again, as I stated uh, through the letters that King Alfonso uh, M. Bob Bumble, which is the original name, which we know his name got changed after he converted into Christianity, and they gave him the Alfonso, the first name, um, which is a Portuguese name. But he knew he made a mistake once the muskets, those guns, came into the area, and he let the Portuguese merchants in the area with their goods. And they began to cover up the society and bribe the local people in the society um, to kick, to illegally kidnap. Because again, in the beginning, the prisons of war that the people in the Congolese had, they did, they um, uh, they was giving them to the Portuguese and the criminals to the Portuguese. And again, the people in the Congo, because we warred against our brother and our kindreds, and we had people that we that we had in war that we kept. But again, on a previous slide that I showed you, you know, when we talk about slavery, what they call it slavery or, or, or a prison of war, you know, I showed you that the people that were prison of war, they worked for money. I showed you the people, they owned the prison of war, they was able to own land. I also showed you in the slide that they was able to uh, uh, marry locals in that society where there was prisons of war wars. And later on, they was able to, uh, after they worked the dead out, they was able to go uh, go back uh, or they, they was able to continue to integrate into society where they was at or they was uh, 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 allowed to leave. And this was the conception that uh, King Alfonso thought he had when he was giving his prisoners of war and his criminals to the Portuguese for these sugar plantations that was on the islands. Until later on, he found out that they was being mistreated and so forth and so forth. And he did not want it to go on. So he st and he started writing letters because the Congo uh, area or the kingdom started to become depopulated because the uh, Portuguese merchants that was in there that they allowed to come in there and then them giving them the guns, it was easier for people to take uh, their own brother and kindred because they had this technology called the musket. And and it started to cause criminal activity and chaos in the kingdom. So uh, Mobumba or Alfonso, King Alfonso, he started writing these letters back to the Portuguese 
wanted to renegotiate their exchange because in the previous their exchange was we're going to give you this, you're going we're going to give you these goods, you're going to give us this goods. But then later on after they established the plantation, the Portuguese like, "Nah, nah, we're going to cut, we're going to kill the exchange with y'all. We want bodies." And so King Mabumba uh Alfonso agreed to giving them the prisoners of war and uh the criminal, but it was due to due to uh due do them, they will give them. Only the the, uh, the magistrate will be able to give them. The Portuguese couldn't come in and just start taking pe people willy-nilly. They would do it. They will be over there, and they will be the ones who they give to the Portuguese until they let the merchants in. And the merchants started bribing the people in the society with the goods uh, in order to kidnap the people in the Congo, you know what I'm saying, and take them to the, so they can uh, brand them and take them on to the sugar plantation. Yep. Peace, peace, uh, uh, brother Allen. Peace, uh, James Hawthorne. Peace, uh, hi, I'm your Biff. All right. This is the, my summary. The damage the slave trade caused Africa can never be fully calculated, but some statements can be made with a certainty. The slave trade caused direct loss of life through warfare, both Europeans and among African ethnic groups. Fighting caused indirect loss of life through destruction of crops and food storage areas. And that destruction of the crops, because again, uh, after they got the muskets and the gunpowder and they allowed the Portuguese to come into, the missionaries to come in, and they allowed the merchants to come in with their goods, the merchants started bribing the people in the society, so the crops went unattended because the people in the society started trying to go and kidnap people for the Portuguese so they can get, exchange more of the technology uh, and the knowledge of the technology and the goods that the uh, Portuguese merchants had, they wanted uh, they wanted to acquire all those those great things. So the crops and so forth was was lacking. There was nobody to tend to the crops, the plant, so forth. And throughout the spread of diseases, we know when the Portuguese came in, we know they came in spreading diseases. Um, the slave trade enriched African kingdoms and com uh, 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 communities that have developed advanced methods of warfare but destroyed many smaller populations that fell victim to the conquest. Many captives died while being transported to the coast or on the voyage overseas. The result was the loss of millions of lives. However, the Congo interior suffered far less from the slave trade than did many areas of West Africa and the coastal area of Central Africa, the main source of slaves taken from European traders. Historians estimate that one and a half million slaves were taken out of the Congo area. So there were more taken out of West Africa than they were taken out of the Congo, uh, taken out of the Congo area. It was taken out of the Congo area. So this concludes my uh, presentation. And um, I hope I was able to walk y'all through, because I tried to walk y'all through who was the Portuguese, what was the Portuguese, uh, what was the Portuguese discovery, which developed into the age of discovery. So I wanted to give y'all, yes, I'm trying to work on the time. I'm jump, I'm working on the time. I was 17 minutes good from the two hour, two and a half hour presentation that I've been doing. So I'm, I'm trying to get it down saying, so I'm doing good. Um, so y'all know who the Portuguese is, who they stem from, uh, the Portuguese area. Uh, we talked about, uh, Prince Henry, Prince Henry funded, uh, the, uh, uh, explained, uh, uh, funded the exploration. We, uh, 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 established that he established an institution in order for them to create the technology in order for people to start setting sail across the Atlantic ocean prior to the Portuguese. There was nobody selling across going worldwide until until around the 15th and the 16th century. You know, I know people say we set sail way before we was over here doing such and such, but prior to uh, uh, to them creating the technology through the school of Prince Henry the Navigator, which ne Prince Henry, again, was not a navigator. He never set sail anyway. He was the prince of King John during the, the Portuguese discovery to develop into the age of discovery. He funded the explorations of people going into, so I named some of the explorer dials, which we're gonna talk about his grandson in the next presentation, 
uh, the warrior queen um, of, of Nidongo, which I'll probably do tomorrow. I'll do Wednesday, one of the two, which it'll be on my channel. It won't be on uh, Facebook. It'll be on my channel. So be looking forward to that. So we'll talk about his son, and we're going to talk about a little bit more about the Portuguese in the Congo and what this warrior king uh, did. I'm going to try to go in the depth about the queen. I'm going to try to go in the depth about her brother, her father, her exchanging with the Portuguese in the Congo area, her being uh, the queen of Ndongo, which was a kingdom of the Congo empire. And then she going into Mapatapa, uh, how she ended up in that region and so forth, and the things that she did. And we're going to talk about the Ingbangala, which I may do a presentation on these individuals as well, because they played a significant role in the slave trade in the Congo during the 16th century, which Queen Azinga is king is kin to King Alfonso. The guy that I talk about, King Alfonso M. Mubaba, and I talked about his father, Juan the First, who name was Nukunwa, who was who was converted in 1941 to Christianity, and then said, "Now nah, I'm gonna throw this in the trash," and threw Christianity in the trash. And then when his son took over, Mubumba took over, and he became Alfonso the First. He began to convert all the people into uh, in the Congo area into. Uh, 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 Christians and set up churches and brought in Portuguese missionary and sent his son to Portugal to train to be a priest and then come back uh, to be uh, a bishop over the churches uh, in the Congo. But uh, I'm going to touch a little bit more on that because all this that I'm talking about, the three presentations is all connecting and they're all intertwined. Uh, so y'all established. So we got the establishment of the Portuguese. Why they came into Africa? They said, "Sir, we know Prince Henry was fascinated and wanted to know more and were interested about what else was going on in uh, in Africa." We're gonna talk about the slave trades a little bit more, those slaves route a little bit more, and what the Portuguese did to the people, to the Muslims that was already, you know, what I'm saying, uh, in those uh, in those areas, how they cut out the slave routes and did some. You know some 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 things. These guys was thinkers, and again, them creating the technology. I showed you the caravan boat. This technology, them creating the caravan boat, showed you the boat. We should, we we established that uh, uh, Christopher Columbus used this. Uh, uh, the guy who used this. Um, uh, Dios used this, and some other explorers, uh, Portuguese explorer, used this new boat that they had. Uh, to create, I showed you the people that the the, uh, the Mobutu, or uh, the uh, the uh, uh, anthropologists called the pygmy people, the small people. They was in that area at first in Central Africa, and then the people from West Africa in 500 uh, uh, 500 BCE came into uh, Central Africa. The West African people, they uh, the Bantu, the Nintu which means person. And then later on, you had the people from the East migrated into Central Africa and they intertwined with each other and created other ethnic groups, which we got the, Cong the, the Congolese people and then created the, uh, the, uh, the Congo empire and so forth. We talked about uh, uh, Nukumu, we talked about Mubaba, so we know who they are. We talked about um, what he, uh, what they was exchanging with the Portuguese. We, we, we talked about who arrived in the Congo uh, and so forth. We talked about um, them, wanting, uh, them wanting bodies, wanted to renegotiate. They wanted bodies because they established these plantations for the sugar cane. Uh, uh, it just, uh, and um, what happened, the letters, him writing the letters, him, you know, bringing the merchants and so forth in there. Uh, so I hope this was a good presentation. I hope uh, people learned, uh, you know, found it interesting uh, and want to go do some further more, uh, research on the Congo area and some further research on who these Portuguese people uh, are. But these are my reference up here on the uh, up here that I'm looking at. Like I say, you can go through the reference. You can scrutinize my references uh, if you want to. You know what I'm saying? I'm always up for critique. I'm always up for uh, uh, input. And um, so forth. I hope you appreciated the presentation. I hope I let no one down. Uh, again, here, so please uh, subscribe to Kofi Paisa TV, the channel that takes the black woman, black man, and black child, Eurocentric mind, and Africanizer. Uh, 
uh, here you can see here the Seshu. I'm a group of the Seshu Ma'ani Metaneta group, and I'm also a member, a new member of the Masi Warrior Clan. So uh, subscribe to Seshu Ma'ani Metaneta YouTube channel, as well as subscribe to our Masi Warrior Clan channel as well. Be looking for more content from off of my page. Be looking for more content from the group. I'm in the session. Be looking for more content from the Masi Warrior Clan, which I'm also a member in. So please subscribe, 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 uh, and support us. Uh, on that note, I want to say Shimim Hotep. Shimim Hotep means depart uh, in peace. And catch y'all either tomorrow or on Tuesday, which will be on Kofi Paisa TV. And I'll put the link in the what's name. So check out that. That's going to be a nice little presentation. Um, Master Warrior. Master, Master Queen Warrior of uh, Nagongo, which is now the region called Angola. Uh, Shimon Hotel. Man in the full knowledge of himself is a superb and supreme creature of creation. When man becomes possessor of the knowledge of himself, he becomes master of his environment and captain of his own ship, the director of his own destiny, the accomplisher of his own ends. Man should understand himself because man is full of knowledge, and this knowledge is a gift of nature. When Mother Nature created man, she deprived him of nothing. He was given the faculty of understanding all things around him. This faculty for understanding has not been taken away from him. None of his senses have been taken away from him. So there is no excuse for the black man. Bridging my team, green, black and green, queen, the king, salute. Now scream, I say, scream from the lady, I say, I I'm red in my team, red, black, and green, queen, and king, salute, now scream, I shake, scream, from the love of you, I shake, fire from the love of you, I shake. If you're in this live video now, you'll be able to choose. If you're in this live video now, you'll be able to